see. No. Thank you very much, Walter. Um, thank you all for coming out today. Um, thank you to uh, Shamira for helping with things. Also, Jennifer, one of the other staff at the Humanities Center. They do incredible work. Uh, this is one of the bright spots at Wayne State <clears throat> with all of the um, sessions that they have about compelling issues. So um, I'm glad that you could be here today. Um, this is the second time I, I've given this talk. The first time I gave it was in Berlin in, Ger in July. Hence, uh, I didn't change the title page. So the word Kulturkampf is a culture war in German. Um, and uh, for those of you who might be interested, the cover of this magazine, Der Spiegel, uh, which is a leading magazine in, in Germany, had what became a rather provocative um, cartoon on the front. It, it quickly became a, uh, went viral and became a, a, a meme, I guess, uh, of uh, Donald Trump uh, cutting off the head of the Statue of Liberty. Um, <clears throat> and. Uh, for those of you who remember, there was a little engagement between Stephen Miller, the white nationalist who was part of the Trump administration, and some uh, journalists about what the meaning of the Statue of Liberty was and the words by Emma Lazarus on the Statue of Liberty. So, uh, <clears throat> kind of interesting. Um, just a little quote from Antonio Gramsci, the great uh, 20th century Italian Marxist, who uh, I, I think was rather far-sighted when he talked about uh, potential crisis uh, because uh, we are confronting that kind of crisis today where the old order is really dying. Um, what we hope will be a, a new, uh, not a necessarily a new world order, but something that is much more egalitarian uh, is still in birthing. Uh, and, uh, and in this interregnum, as he said, there's a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. And, Donald Trump is one of those morbid symptoms, mm -hmm. <laughs> I would argue. Uh, but he is part of a longer and deeper um, contour of conditions that I really want to <clears throat> that I want to talk about. And I know we're all probably tired of hearing about Donald Trump. Well, you know, the media has <clears throat> gone overboard constantly on what Trump's tweets and um, you know. Uh, everybody has grown tired of them, I think. But what I really want to focus on is the constellation of historical, economic, socio-cultural, and social-psychological conditions that help explain Trump's presidency not as an aberration, but as a culmination of a wide variety of conditions uh, in uh, contemporary United States. And I want to highlight in particular <clears throat> <clears throat> certain white working class voters, particularly in the Rust Belt area, um, who in the 2016 election uh, cast their vote uh, for Donald Trump, many uh, of whom are now uh, having buyer's remorse. Today's the Guardian newspaper uh, had a really interesting article about that kind of, uh, of buyer's remorse. Um, and of course it was in place like Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin which provided the electoral uh, victory uh, for Donald Trump because we still have uh, a, a crazy electoral system uh, which is not uh, democratic. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about those constellation forces, but I'm going to talk about them in terms of how they've emerged over the last 40 years or so. And I want to highlight also in that discussion some of the deeply rooted racial and ethno-cultural threads that continue to inform <clears throat> what has become Trumpism or white identity politics. So what I'd like to do is begin with a personal anecdote, will provide an entry point to my uh, topic for today. Back in late September of 2016, as a member of the Peace Action of Michigan and MCHR, Michigan Coalition for Human Rights, I had arranged for a local movie theater, Cinema Detroit, which you should, if you haven't been there, you should take advantage of. Um, to uh, show a documentary film called National Bird, which was about U.S. military whistleblowers and the drone warfare in Afghanistan. As the moderator for a discussion of the film, I introduced a member of MCHR who was an Iraq War veteran from the white working class 
um, with a, a very interesting background. Upon returning from his tour of duty, he began working at a local defense plant. Then in the aftermath of the revelations by Edward Snowden, he quit his job, becoming in the process a peace activist. During the Q&A, following his brief comments on the film, he was asked who he had planned to vote for in the presidential election, since, especially since he had previously voted for Barack Obama in 2012. When he responded that he was leaning toward Donald Trump, there was an audible angry uh, and aggrieved reaction from the crowd. I, I tried to quiet the shouts and denunciations to return to the subject at hand, but it was clear that his presidential choice was seen by this activist crowd as a, some sort of betrayal. In fact, it was his own sense of betrayal by those like Hillary Clinton who drove him as a can, uh, to a candidate. It, it, these were, of course, Clinton was a supporter of the Iraq War. Um, and it was that in particular that drove him uh, to, to Donald Trump. And it's interesting, there's been a study fairly recently of, of um, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin as uh, states that have had higher than normal um, deaths and uh, injuries from the Iraq-Afghanistan wars. Um, so he might not have been an, uh, an anomaly in this. Uh, clearly there was an indication that the white working class men uh, living in the Rust Belt were prepared to vote for Donald Trump because he offered what they then believed to be certain, some of the issues on foreign domestic policy which were alternatives to the establishment. Um, indeed, as I'll talk about in the, in the election res, uh, results, a recent survey of former 2012 Obama voters in Michigan found that 30% of them had uh, voted against Clinton by voting for Trump. Uh, given what may be both representative of and atypical from other Trump white male working class voters in the Rust Belt, what can we deduce from the 2016 presidential election results that tell us something about how class, gender, and race uh, fit, figured intersectionally in this election? Moreover, how can we better understand Trumpism, in particular as a constellation of ideological and cultural currents in American life, especially but not exclusively related to the white working class. And here I want to emphasize, again, that the average Trump voter was not a working class voter. The average Trump voter was a middle class voter making 72,000, mm -hmm. living in suburban or rural communities. Uh, the white working class has become, uh, for some, a convenient whipping boy, so to speak. Uh, and it's necessary to better understand the nature of what we mean by class and uh, how we define that class. So the working class, uh, if uh, we want to look at a, a more expansive definition uh, beyond those who work for a wage, um, that's somewhat problematic and contested and it's too exclusionary. Um, you know, there are uh, women who do not work for a wage, who do social reproduction work, uh, who are part of the working class. Um, so there's a more inclusive definition that I want to use, one whose labor power is commodified through coercion. In other words, it's about the power relationships that operate uh, in everyday life and also embedded in particular occupations uh, that define what we consider to be the working class. And it's Michael Zweig, Zweig does, sociologist from SUNY, um, uh, Long Island. Uh, he identifies about 63% of the U.S. labor force as working class. Now, when you begin to identify how many of that working class is unionized, those numbers begin to go down uh, rather uh, enormously. From 1950 at some high points of 35% of the working class organized to today 11, 10% uh, more 
in the public sector than the private sector, which is one of the reasons why Republicans have been driving hard to destroy the public sector, because it's within the public sector, particularly that women and African Americans and people of color in general have been able to get an escalator into the middle class. So here, see a little bit of the composition of the, <clears throat> the working class. It's been, uh, the uh, number of white men has been going down as the number of blacks and Hispanics has been going up. So the vision somehow that the working class is white is, uh, is, uh, is a misrepresentation, uh, kind of a major misrepresentation. That doesn't, however, uh, eliminate the fact that within that working class there are all kinds of divisions, racial, ethno-cultural, skill, um, and uh, there's been, of course, also a weakening of the organized working class through uh, outsourcing, automation. If any of you have read the book by Tom Segru called the, uh, uh, the Origins of the Urban Crisis, you know, this goes back in Detroit to 1950s. So we're talking about a long term <coughs> trajectory of outsourcing. Um, of automation and for those of you who are about to enter the workforce you youngsters here uh, you know you may find indeed that it's not going to be possible to get a full-time job you're going to be working as a temp and temporary workers um, have grown enormously over uh, the past 30 uh, years uh, and all of this of course is is combined with what goes back to the attack on unions, uh, particularly in, in Ronald Reagan's uh, presidency, uh, creating uh, what some have referred to as a risk society. So let's talk a little bit about the socioeconomic setting. Again, I'm trying to define a larger constellation of forces that we call, can call Trumpism, uh, and not just who Donald Trump is, but what has brought us to this particular point in time. So we have, in a sense, a, the socioeconomic setting, and I think you can't talk about uh, Trumpism without understanding neoliberalism and neoliberal globalization. And this is the kind of movement that's happened globally that also helps to explain the rise of the right in France, in Eastern Europe, uh, in Germany, in England. Uh, these are the sorts of things where there have been deindustrialization where financialization has, and financial speculation, uh, speculation has increased, uh, particularly starting in the 1970s and the great work by the recently passed historian Judith Stein on the 1970s shows how many uh, banks were turning from uh, providing money uh, for manufacturing to uh, beginning to explore more speculative um, investment pra practices. So uh, also said in that is a declining U.S. global hegemony. And I think this is really important. And it's one of the things that's often not talked about, but I guess I did talk about it in my book. So uh, <laughs> it's a little, yeah. uh, sorry to be unhumble about that. But, uh, and, and I, th I think whatever, uh, and particularly when, and you'll see this also in another interesting way in the Colin Kaepernick thing, uh, well, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and that is that often working class folks who are so disrespected in this society in any number of ways, one way in which they feel they have some status is by identifying with the, with the uh, state, the sort of the vision of this powerful uh, country still uh, you know, walking astride the globe. But it isn't that way. It hasn't been that way. Uh, since the defeat in Vietnam, uh, and uh, we'll talk more about that later. Also, the emergence of what some people call as casino capitalism or vulture capitalism, which is David Harvey, uh, the Marxist geographer, talks saw, says, an unholy alliance between state powers and the predatory aspects of finance capital forms the cutting edge of vulture capitalism. That is as much about cannibalistic practices and forced evaluations as it about achieving harmonious global development. And we have our own, uh, you may not see Dan Gilbert as a vulture capitalist, but think about how Dan Gilbert came to uh, power through and quickened loans. And according to my Michigan State uh, 
graduating daughter years ago. He was uh, ran a gambling racket up there. So uh, here's casino capitalism operating. Um, so. Um, now, I want, it's important also to understand the nature of this inequality which has developed and which has created a great deal of dislocation, uh, particularly for uh, people uh, in the bottom 90%. I mean, as you can see, this is an interesting chart originally based on the work of Thomas Piketty, um, but put together um, by Paulina Cherneva. Uh, uh, was used in turn by Bernie Sanders in his, uh, in his campaign. And what it essentially shows is how you have an increasing amount of wealth going to the top 10% and a decreasing amount of wealth going to the bottom 90%. And this is what the so-called tax reform that the Republicans have just passed and are trying to shove down our throats um, uh, that, that just recently passed, uh, and they're still working out some of, the, some of the details. But basically, it's a redistribution of wealth from uh, middle class, working class, up to uh, the 10% and the 1%. Um, and uh, of course, Steve Fraser, in his wonderful book called The Age of Acquiescence, says this, and he underscores, the cultural implications of this. The shift from industrial to finance-driven capitalism was accompanied by a cultural phase change whose impact on the self-esteem of working people and their public regard was disarming and devastating. So let's talk a little bit about the social cultural background, right? The rise of celebrity culture. Because who is Donald Trump, right? How did he come to be uh, well known not just by Trump Tower, but also, how many people watched The Apprentice? I, mean, uh, okay. I never saw it, uh, but, uh, you know. And also, I guess he was involved in the WWE, the World Wrestling Federation. Um, so here's the rise of celebrity culture, uh, where you can transform your cultural capital into political capital. Um, and this doesn't happen just on the right, it also can happen on the left. Um, you know, people like Michael Moore uh, becomes that kind of iconic figure um, on, on the left. Um, also, media culture in general. Uh, there's an incredible book written years and years ago by a man by the name of Neil Postman, who was a communication specialist who studied, um, the book was called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And basically, Postman uh, said that there, he was, to some extent, uh, analyzing what he considered, in effect, a dumbing down of America. Uh, and what he did, interestingly, is he took the speeches of Abraham Lincoln and the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and he lined those up with the uh, Reagan-Walter Mondale debates and talked about how the level of intelligence had been diminished in the, some of those discussions. So we've got media culture and the society of the spectacle, um, and, and we get uh, what is sometimes called infotainment and the trivialization of, of discourse, and people overwhelmed by all of these media uh, memes, uh, uh, absorbing them uh, without critical consciousness and gaining what some people refer to as knowledgeable ignorance. Now, there's a long-term trend also that's been part of American life that Richard Hofstetter, way back in the 1950s, one of the great American historians, identified as anti-intellectualism. Um, and uh, it plays out in a particularly uh, interesting way that helps to define Trumpism. Um, there's updating of, uh, of some of that by in Susan Jacoby's work, uh, uh, The Age of American Unreason, where she talks about the persistence of religious fundamentalism, anti-rationalism in American life. And Trump 
gained, uh, you know, had an overwhelming uh, support among evangelicals, um, even higher than George Romney did in, uh, in uh, I'm not George Romney, <laughs> Mitt Romney. <laughs> That's a, that's a senior moment, going back to his, his father. And <clears throat> so Mitt Romney. Um, <clears throat> so you have a kind of anti-rationalism, re religious fundamentalism. And of course, that, they are part of the governmental project of Trump now uh, with people like Betsy DeVos, uh, Ben Carson, uh, and, and others in the, uh, in the cabinet, um, and, and Pence himself who is a uh, religious fundamentalist. Um, and it's important to understand that it's not just anti-elitism -elit per se, it's anti-elitism of a particular kind. That is, professionals, upper middle class professionals, are often seen uh, as more antagonistic to workers than the very wealthy. Because it's often those folks including myself, right? Uh, lawyers, doctors, who they have most contact with and who often treat them uh, and trivialize them and infantilize them in, in many ways. So the cultural clash that occurs is not so much between, let's say, uh, the rich and the working class as much as it might be between um, upper middle class professionals um, and the working class. Here's Henry Giraud, uh, the election of Donald Trump to the presidency is a case study <coughs> in how politics has been emptied of any substance, hence the media culture, the society, the spectacle, and civic literate, illiteracy has been normalized. And just recently, um, there was a poll that uh, Pew Research did um, of... Uh, only 36% of Republicans believe that colleges do more good than harm. Only 36% of Republicans believe that colleges do more good than harm. That's why it might be a really uphill battle to get free college tuition, as you guys should have, and as Bernie was running on, uh, you know, because there are people who are still antagonistic to even the idea uh, of going into your, uh, to, uh, of college. So, um, and, and I want to link this again, this, um, this kind of intellectualism, anti-intellectualism and civic illiteracy, I think is part and parcel of the rise of neoliberalism. Uh, because neoliberalism is about evacuating, emptying out the public arena, destroying the public sector, uh, making the public sector become squalid while enriching the private sector. Um, and uh, as uh, one analyst suggests, as a process of institutional political regression, the neoliberal revolt inaugurated a new age of post-factual politics. So I think you need to see the issue of post-factual politics in a larger socioeconomic and sociocultural uh, context. Uh, so which one is it, the blue pill or the red pill? <laughs> for those of you who are fans of socio-psychological uh, conditions. I, I think that fear and paranoia have been deeply rooted in this country. Michael Moore, in his uh, film on Bowling for Columbine, has a phenomenal little uh, animated part of that, where he talks about the emergence of the Second Amendment and the gun worshiping, gun fetishization in the United States. And it's all about, you know, historically, uh, well, there were all these native peoples out there. What were they threatening in the woods somewhere? And then we had to deal with the slaves because we had to keep them down, right? So this notion of fear and paranoia is deeply rooted in the history of oppression, um, of genocide and oppression in, in uh, U.S. history. And it's also further reinforced by the kind of imperial enclosures that we have, the sense that everybody's out to get us or, uh, you know, and now it's of course been blamed on Muslims in general, that's Trumpism, Islamophobia is sort of part of that uh, fear and paranoia. Now, anger and resentment, um, 
and especially has, it's not only racial resentment, there's class resentment, but racial resentment is a particular significant element of it. And it's really well explored in Arlie Hochschild's book, Strangers in Their Own Land, which is about these rural, white, working class folks in Louisiana and why they vote for the Republicans who are going to screw them over, um, you know, in terms of uh, economic, economic. But their identity is not so much on the ideological basis, it's a kind of white identity with the party that will protect them from having governments give handouts to undeserving people, i.e., who are the undeserving people, right? <laughs> uh, all right, so part of the problem, of course, is also uh, this humiliation that often um, uh, is sometimes piled on by liberals in, in particular. Um, Hillary Clinton calling people who supported Trump a basket of deplorables. Uh, that didn't help. Uh, Thomas Frank's book, Listen Liberal, is just uh, a really excellent book about that kind of, of um, uh, humiliation that goes on. And there's a new book by Katherine Kramer, uh, which is a study of Wisconsin rural voters called The Politics of Resentment. And again, this helps to explain a lot of Trump's win in uh, Wisconsin, the way that people feel they've been disrespected. Uh, Justin Jest even talks about it as a minoritization of, 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 of the white working class. Um, now, it has its, obviously, racial components. but um, And there's another element to it, too, which is discussed in some of the polls and studies that were done. Uh, going back to that old study from the Frankfurt School on authoritarian, authoritarian personalities. And certainly people attracted to uh, Donald Trump are also attracted to authoritarian uh, types. Now, the, this election also turned on the fact that there are all kinds of things which are uh, wrong with the electoral system. And we could spend another whole lecture talking about that. Everything from dark money that Jane Mayer talks about, uh, the Citizens United, uh, you know. So we have to disabuse of our, ourselves of the notion that this is a democracy. This is an oligarchy. And in fact, rapidly becoming a kleptocracy. That is uh, a, another great Greek word. Everything can be traced to the Greek. Mm -hmm. uh, so classy <laughs> is rule, klepto is the thieves. Rule by the thieves. Uh, the predator in chief is in the White House right now. And he's uh, uh, a, a poster child for the kleptocrats. Um, so uh, there was also, a, there has been a campaign by the Republican Party, deep roots in the Republican Party, uh, going back to disenfranchise uh, voters, particularly uh, people of color. Going uh, state, out state Republicans trying to suppress the vote. Um, in Detroit, for example. 14 states had voting restrictions in effect in 2016, strict voter ID laws, fewer opportunities for early voting and reductions in the number of polling places, particularly for students who couldn't find those, those polling places. And there are already millions of disenfranchised ex-felons who cannot vote in an overwhelming number of states. And it's estimated that even in, in, in Florida alone, 33% of African American men are disenfranchised because they have a record. Um, so uh, the other thing I think that's important to understand here is that the change in turnout rates of blacks and whites in states in 2012 and 2016, which this captures, the black vote in effect was not only suppressed, but it was also you know, a certain kind of apathy or even antipathy to Hillary Clinton in the background of the welfare reform that was passed under her husband in uh, the 1990s. Um, uh, and talking about predators, uh, you know, and black youth. Uh, so large, f smaller turnout for African Americans, a suppressed vote of African Americans, and uh, a rise in the number of white votes uh, uh, all helps to explain what happens with these electoral votes. And I think it's important to understand that in Wisconsin alone, 300,000 people were kicked off the voting rolls. Um, and that 
had uh, most likely a very uh, major impact uh, for the 20,000 vote margin, I think, that Donald Trump had in uh, Wisconsin. So, what has uh, Trumpism as an electoral project? And here I want to differentiate the electoral project versus the governmental project. The electoral project, Trump would try to run as a faux populist, you know, embracing certain things about, criticizing some things about the wars, the Afghanistan war, why are we sending troops over there, and now we're sending more troops over there, right? Uh, that's the adult in the room, General Mad Dog Mathis, who helped to uh, shovel more uh, young men and women into that, uh, that uh, graveyard of empires in Afghanistan. Um, so, uh, here's another great uh, cartoon from the front of the Daily News when Trump came for the Mexicans. I did not speak out as well. Mexican. This is on the basis of Pastor Niemöller's famous uh, uh, s speech about the Nazis in Germany. As I was not a Mexican, when he came for the Muslims, I did not speak out as a not a Muslim. Then it came for me. Um, so, What's the, uh, I think you have to t talk about the persistence of xenophobia, nativism, and, and racism. And this goes down to the beginning of the 20th century. Right? Who are all these in immigrants who are coming in, who are going to violate um, the, the purity of, of, of America? And uh, just as you had nativist responses uh, in the 1920s that effectively shut the gates to much immigration. So Trump has tried again and again, and now the third time, to shut the gates to um, refugees coming from particular countries that has been challenged in the courts because it's been seen as a Muslim ban. So this, again, has deep roots. Um, it's not surprising that you know, Donald Trump's dad was a member of the Ku Klux Klan, um, and the Klan was very big in the 1920s. Here, in, in Detroit, and they, they won an election in Detroit in the late uh, 20s. Um, so uh, so what, how does this mobilize class and racial resentment? Why did Colin Kaepernick take a knee in the first place? To protest what was the racial injustice that the, you know, that was clearly being illuminated by Black Lives Matter. Now, it's not surprising that 70% of the NFL are African Americans, right? And also that they're well paid. So you mobilize racial sentiment, you mobilize resentment, you mobilize class resentment, and you wrap yourself in an American flag as Donald Trump tried to do, um, and many veterans said this is not disrespecting uh, our tr the troops, right? uh, but this is trying to bring light to what is a continuing problem of injustice to people of color in society. Um, but Trump's very adept at using any uh, possible incident uh, to cover his own failures and to uh, try to stir up a base. Now, having said that, can't separate out people who in communities throughout the Rust Belt, um, in Reading, Pennsylvania, about which a great play has been written called Sweat by Lynn Nottage, African-American woman. Um, in Reading, in Youngstown, Ohio, Justin Jest's book of Youngstown. In Wixom, Michigan, uh, the, where the plant, no, where the Ford plant has disappeared, has been basically disappeared, and with that, all those jobs. Um, and throughout Ohio, Wisconsin, Indiana, over and over, plant closures that happened. Uh, and this has an effect. This has an effect for, uh, on people who think, well, if somebody's going to come along maybe and save these, return jobs again, as Donald Trump promised. Now, he certainly um, has 
played on the dislocations that have been part and parcel of West Virginia and coal miners there, but everybody admits that most of those jobs are not coming back, even though there's an attempt to rev up the reliance on fossil fuels to the detriment of all of us on the planet. But if you look through, um, you can see, and of course, lots of people saw Hillary Clinton promoting the TPP, it's the gold standard of trade agreements, the Trans-Pacific uh, Pact, uh, NAFTA, supported by uh, Bill Clinton. All of this was seen as something that threatened the livelihood, uh, and not imaginary livelihood, but real lives of people. In many of these being small communities, right? Ashtabula, Lorraine, uh, Beaver, Pennsylvania, all of these places which uh, actually went for Donald Trump. And you can see this is uh, my, my uh, this is the difference between um, in 2012 uh, the disparity uh, between Obama, you know, Obama winning in these places over, or 28 in, uh, over uh, McCain, and then what happened in the transformation of Trump winning over Clinton. So that major shift, as I mentioned earlier, that there are people who voted for uh, Barack Obama thinking that he would uh, be the great change um, and saw that things uh, didn't change as much as they would have hoped for, particularly in communities which were suffering manufacturing losses. All right, so uh, the presidential election polls. Um, uh, Clinton wins uh, under people who made less than 50,000. So that's an important, again, thing to underscore. Still among poorer people, um, you know, the what working class, she's winning those votes, but Trump wins with over 50,000. Clinton wins 51% of the human, union households, but Obama got 60%. So there's a depression in that the union household. Now, union household doesn't mean everybody in the union is a member, I mean, everybody in the household is a member of the union. Trump wins among those with only a high school education and some college. Specifically, whites without a college degree give Trump a 67 to 28 percent advantage. Uh, so in places in wealth. Um, and Clinton won in 500 counties that account for 64 percent of the economic activity in the United States. Trump won more than 2,600 counties which account for only 36 percent of the wealth in the United States. So uh, Clinton wins in cities, uh, but Trump winning in suburbs and in small towns, overwhelmingly. Um, so what is Trumpism as a governmental project? Um, cabinet of billionaires, militarists, and know-nothings. Um, and uh, we can talk about all of those, uh, you know, the, the white nationalist component of that. Uh, Steve Bannon, who's gone, but is coming to Michigan to raise funds for the Republican Party at Andiamo and Warren on November 8th at 5 o'clock. Just in case you want to get some you know, uh, pizza. Um, Steve Miller, however, part of that white nationalist bloc is still driving policy in the Trump administration on immigration. You've got the Wall Street, uh, you know, honchos, uh, Steve Munchkin, uh, Mnuchin, uh, Wilbur Ross, but all of them come from more speculative uh, wings of the um, of capital. And then you still have the Goldman Sachs people because it's basically an oligarchy. It doesn't make a difference whether it's Republicans or Democrats. 
Goldman Sachs will always have its hand in the pot. Um, we've got the extractive populists, uh, extractive capital, Tillerson, Rex Tillerson, Secretary of State coming from Exxon, one of the biggest polluters in the, in the world. Uh, Steve Pruitt, who was a shill for the, uh, the Attorney General of Oklahoma, was a shill for the Koch brothers. And then the Christian right. And of course, you've got the whole military industrial complex. Um, and uh, and in particular, uh, Mattis, Kelly, and McMaster, uh, and their kind of uh, Pentagon imperialism. Um, and here's something I think Mike Davidson might be appropriate to the younger members of the audience. Trumpism, whatever its temporary successes, cannot unify millennials' economic distress with that of older white workers because it interposes geriatric white privilege and dying of an older worker. As the touchstone of all its policies, the real opportunity for transformational political change belongs to the Sanderistas, but only to the extent that they remain rebels against the neoliberal democratic establishment and support the resistance in the streets. And here we come to the uplifting part of the program. Um, and uh, the Women's March, uh, which was a great uh, outpouring of those who uh, shouted loudly, not my president. I was in uh, New York uh, after, immediately after the election in, uh, in Washington Square Park where tens of thousands of kids from all kinds of NYU, all sorts of schools were marching in, high schools coming in, uh, and then marching up to Trump Tower. Um, so the resistance manifests itself in any number of ways. Um, uh, there's an upcoming national convention. It's going starting today, I think, at downtown Detroit. That's a convention, unfortunately, I don't think they've made uh, enough room for people who don't have a lot of money. <laughs> and unfortunately, um, you know, this, this makes it not a cross-class alliance as it should, needs to be. But Indivisible, how many of you heard of it? Uh, I've heard of Indivisible. I know some of you are participants in it. There are over 6,100 chapters around the country. And not just large cities, but also small, small cities. And I must say that in the Indivisible chapter that I uh, am part of, and it's represented here by a number of uh, people from that chapter. It has been women in particular who have taken the leadership and have done an inordinately great job in lobbying against uh, all of the worst sorts of things that have been going on uh, under the Trump administration. Um, so, but it has to expand, it has to get uh, larger, it has to become in Naomi Klein's words, a book I would highly recommend, no is not enough. Uh, so resisting Trump's shock politics and winning the world we need. Uh, check out Naomi Klein's book. And I'll end um, another quote from Henry Howard Cagill on, on resistance. Contemporary resistance is engaged in defiant delegitimizing de of existing and potential domination but without any prospect of a final outcome. We're not sure what's going to happen in this interregnum, right? But uh, it needs to think of itself uh, more in the ways of what are the transformational reforms that are essential, and how do we get to the point of making those transformational reforms. Uh, what time is it, by the way? I don't want to leave time for questions. 1.19. 1.19. 11 minutes All right. All right. Uh, I was going to... Uh, play the um, no M&M, uh, and, but I'll just say, you can go online, uh, see it, because I want to have time for, for questions, is M&M rant. And one thing that we need to, th this defines the, the, this difference, this class difference. Um, specifically, Robert Ritchie, growing up in uh, white suburban Romeo, now known as Kid Rock, being a supporter of Donald Trump, and Eminem, or Marshall Mathers III, growing up in the, among the working class in Detroit. So we have our own, um, in a sense, template for the distinction, uh, for the difference between class differences here of support and opposition uh, to uh, 
Donald Trump. Um, so thank you. Um, if you want to get your rant for the day, you can uh, just watch the Eminem uh, YouTube video. Um, but I'm now, I've, whatever questions, comments, criticisms you have, I'm more than willing to. It just means ruling norms, essentially. It's a, a Greek word. A Greek word. Well, it originally is Greek, but uh, it was a word that Antonio Gramsci used to try to describe that uh, the ruling class rules not just by coercion, but also by co-optation. So hegemony is a part of ruling norms and ideas uh, that operate in any society, usually reflecting those who have the most power in that society. But always there's a contest going on between those who are outside or you know, contesting that power. So it's never stable. It's always in the process of being reformulated. And that's what we have to do. <laughs> we have to transform this in a way so that the hegemonic order is not reflective of the 1%. But like those of us participating, who, as I did, in the Occupy Wall Street, we were down downtown in Detroit, uh, occupying uh, uh, campus marshes. Grant Circus Park. Great, yeah, Grant Circus Park, yes. Uh, which has now become pro private space, I think. Um, OK. Uh, other questions, comments? Yes. Um, I was wondering if you could talk. You acknowledged at the start of the talk that the um, majority of voters who voted for Trump were members of the middle class, not the working class. So could you talk a little bit about what your research on um, these constellations that have informed sort of white working class culture and um, alliance with Trump, how, how that might relate and help explain the middle class's voting activity as well? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> you know, that. Middle, how, how we define the middle class and how we define the working class is yeah. really important because uh, middle class can often be an ideological definition, mm -hmm. an aspirational one. Mm -hmm. It has very little to do with you know, people often who are making $35,000 an hour working uh, a non-unionized uh, 45 hours, 50 hours a week will say, well, I'm middle class mm -hmm. um, because it's, it's aspirational in that sense. But I think, uh, you know, basically you can talk about class in relationship to, uh, um, you know, your occupation, in relationship to education, in relationship to um, ethno-cultural background. All of those things uh, help to define the class location. It does, it's not just reduced to how much money you make. Even mm -hmm. you can make, as baseball players a long time did, make a lot of money but they were still essentially slaves of the owners. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to, and it wasn't until there was a challenge uh, by Kurt Flood, one of the great uh, players, uh, African American, to you know being a piece of property by the by the management. So again, it's the issue of exploitation and oppression. So what you see is a lot of small business people who become and have remained Republicans. Mm -hmm. uh, filling that kind of constellation of uh, sm small business. And you often get then the Republican Party talking about how we are for the small business when in fact, you know, the death tax, when it doesn't affect anybody in the, who has a real small business, it generally affects very, very few people. I think half a, half a million people, I think, totally. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I don't know if that helps to give you a complete uh, answer because it's is sort of complicated about how we try to find out Well, it seems like really a lot of the, the, um, uh, the constellations that you discussed really apply um, to white Americans writ large, right? The declining stature of America's global um, right. position, right. Um, the rise of celebrity culture, you know. Right, so those, are larger, those are larger. Absolutely, those are, those are larger contexts that I wanted to place this discussion in. Mm -hmm. So, but it, it has an impact uh, differentially on people who are in different class locations mm -hmm. and people who are different genders mm -hmm. and people who come from different racial ethnic backgrounds.
So uh, understanding that is also one way of better understanding what drives people's sense of being aggrieved or what drives people's sense of being satisfied with the status quo. Yes? Okay. So you're talking about the been shown that in statistics, so the crime super really constant on their ideals of public and flip with whoever is in charge. How can any how can any party complain about the economy when all they'll do is flip for a second someone in charge says to? But they're essentially not right. to offend anyone but cheap. No, that's an absolutely good great question because it has to do with the transformation of the Democratic Party over a long period of time. Um, and the creation of what was known as the DLC, the Democratic Leadership uh, Council, which became uh, much more oriented to getting money from Wall Street uh, and getting money from big donors in general, uh, and drove, in a sense, pulled the party to the right. That was, I was talking about Republicans. Okay, and, okay, so in Republicans, again, you have two different cleavages, in effect. You have people who are, can be called the country club Republicans who have always represented the, the well-to-do. And then you have the Tea Party Republicans. Okay? Many of them uh, from uh, lower middle class backgrounds uh, who are angry over cultural issues most of the time. Uh, the debates that happened around women's reproductive choice that continue to, to, you know, to um, rile folks up. Um, immigration, um, you know, all kinds of issues around uh, now about Black Lives Matter. You know, all of these sorts of things, again, uh, drive uh, some of that uh, disaffection uh, from the Democratic Party, who that wing of the Republicans seen giving, giving in to immigrants, giving in to uh, African Americans, giving in to women. And therefore, their uh, identity, and their what is a kind of uh, effective partisanship, isn't really represented by uh, by Democrats. And it's something that uh, you know I think Bernie Sanders talked a lot about. How do you reach people in those? Just to comment sure. on that last part, Bernie Sanders' Planned Parenthood was um, establishment, and even though because he did get their endorsement. Considering his eagerness to brought in to support uh, people who are pro-life, in with his pack, the leadership with his leadership fund, couldn't he, couldn't women say that he's not representing us, even though sure. he claims to be a great progressive when he doesn't care about half the population? You could certainly there, there has been that critique, and I think some of it's uh, unfair in what how how it's been uh, you know, lodged against him. Um, and, uh, you know, there is a, well, no, I don't think he, I don't know if he ever said that about Planned Parenthood. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. But I, I, I think you could make the case that Emily's list, Emily's list it has been a part of that democratic centrist uh, reor reorientation. Um, and that is part of more of the Democratic Party establishment. And in fact, they, they, uh, did refuse to endorse some of the insurgent Democrats who were running uh, in some recent campaigns. Um, so, uh, why? Why do they refuse to endorse? Uh, because they're part of that Democratic establishment. I think. They're not, because they're men. No, no, these were women. This is a. I think it was in Nevada. Does somebody remember this case in Nevada? That was a woman, a, a woman an insurgent woman candidate, uh, Latino, running against another candidate. Uh, also a woman, and uh, they, uh, I think they, you know, they, they refused to endorse. I read the book that about um, Emily's list this summer, and they said that since they have limited resources, they choose the candidate that they think is most likely to win. Isn't that the strategy? Well, yeah, that is a, that's, a, that's an important part of strategy. Uh, it sometimes can become uh, a false kind of pragmatism, which is to say, uh, you know, this, we can't we can't actually uh, run on a platform of uh, of single payer healthcare. 
I mean, that would be ridiculous, was what uh, Hillary Clinton said about Bernie Sanders' proposal. Um, but it's not ridiculous. It's not what the majority of people now know want. Uh, you know, and it's not, however, uh, it's up against uh, a, you know, a constellation of uh, forces within the health industry uh, and within uh, other parts of, um, uh, of the economy that uh, resist single payer health. No, 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 please, question. please. No, these um, are important. Bernie questions. Sanders is the governor. It was the is a senator from a state with less than three million people, which right. is ninety six percent white, right. and generally like upper middle class or higher class, to, based on overall gross income. I would dispute that that last point. Okay, okay. but okay. the other two are yeah, essentially the other two are essentially true. And Bernie Sanders also voted against allowing. Um, other to import other countries' drugs to lower prescription drug prices. In uh, I'm not country. sure of that. Uh, maybe, so. maybe it's because he, he thought it wasn't comprehensive enough, but he stuck it. I'm yeah. not sure of that. But, I mean, but that, these are important questions, but, but it, I don't want to... When Sanders what? criticizes Kamala Harris for something she said when she has a state of uh, 55 million people right. with a um, generous amount of minority representation, they're not going to be representing the same interests. Oh, I agree. I agree. You make some valid points, but I think we got to keep our eyes on the prize, so to speak. More important is the fact that the state of Wyoming, which has 600,000 people, has two senators. The state of California, which has 30 million people, has two senators. Why do we have this kind of uh, electoral system and uh, rep so-called representative democracy that continues to uh, favor um, you know, the uh, white rural areas as opposed to uh, larger urban um, uh, states. And uh, well, the, you know, it's also equally benefit from that system with Delaware, Vermont. Oh, sure, Maine. sure. They they can certainly not equally, but but not e but again not equally. If you look at if you look at the overall percentage of popular vote for Democratic Congress people and the overall percentage for uh, Republican, factor in gerrymandering, factor in Citizens United, what you've got is an absolutely illiberal system, an absolutely undemocratic system, um, uh, and we should be, as much as there, should, there can still be debate about the Sanders-Clinton issue, we should be keeping our eyes on that. We have a dysfunctional system that works for the 1%, that does not work for us. Um, and it doesn't make any difference who gets into power. As it does make a difference who gets into power. But as recent studies suggest from Princeton, uh, that study about who actually, when uh, there is financial legislation going through Congress, who wins uh, congressional support the most, it's usually the 1%, not the 99%. So we've, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Um, uh, I think uh, this is a, a large bump in the road. Uh, a lot of it is generated uh, by some of that reaction to, uh, to, um, you know, to having an African American in the White House, the house that slaves built. Um, so uh, let me end with, uh, we're almost at 1.30, I think, let me just end with the story from my granddaughters, because told this last night, but it, it, it helps to maybe assuage some pain that people may be feeling. So um, my two grandkids, eight and four, were sitting around with their babysitter, and they were eating carrots, and the babysitter said, to them, you know, if you eat too many carrots, you can get orange. You can become orange. And my eight-year-old said, is that what happened to Donald Trump? <laughs> and then my four-year-old gave a big sigh and said, I miss Barack Obama. <laughs> All right. there, might, there, might, well, there might be one more question yeah. from somebody else, Who else? Yes. That, that has to be asked. Go on. Um, so you said that something that is important we're not spoken about a lot is declining U.S. hegemony, especially on a worldwide stage. Could you elaborate more on that? Okay. Um, if, you, if you give me your email address, I'll send you the manuscript from my book, okay. <laughs> which is a long elaboration of that, but very, very, very briefly. Okay. Um, coming out of World War II, the United States basically, because it was the preeminent power in the world, set this economic architecture for the world. And in the process established its 
you know, it's outreach, uh, not only economically, but culturally, and then militarily. Um, you know, it controlled three quarters of the gold reserves, it, it manufactured 50% of, uh, of manufacturing goods, and now it's down to about 20% manufacturing goods. Uh, we're off the gold standard, Richmond did that in, in 1971. Um, and, uh, you know, the, if you look at who's the leading producer of steel in the world, uh, you know, it's places like uh, China and Korea and, uh, and Brazil, it's not the United States anymore. Um, uh, all of that is part of a, some, a declining economic agenda. And you know, there are those who argue that the United States, with its 800 military bases around the world, and it's now in 80 countries with spe special forces, including Niger, right? Uh, which is not, it's a long history of Western intervention to underdevelop Africa. As I suppose Walter Rodney said that, uh, the underdevelopment of Africa. Um, right. um, so, uh, uh, you know, that's part of it. Uh, that, that's part of it. And um, I think uh, as every empire uh, historically has seen its power erode, there have been um, <coughs> internal uh, divisions and, um, uh, and and I think we're you know we're we're in that situation now where we still spend an inordinate amount of money uh, that Democrats will vote for also uh, for a seven hundred billion dollar um, so-called defense budget. It's actually more like one trillion when you factor in um, uh, the energy department, the veterans, etc. cetera. Um, so all of that money is uh, a misappropriation to retain the image of a, um, of a behemoth globally, even though um, you know, the United States has been more and more uh, more and more at the mercy of a, a global system um, that were it not for financial financialization, which is the way that the U.S. could keep its control, um, you know, it would be it would be part of a multipolar world instead of just attempting to maintain its agenda. And we're moving towards that in a multipolar world. Um, we have to figure out how we deal with it. Thank you.